Section 1 You will hear some people talking about getting exercise. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 1 and 2. Hey, Janos, have you seen this notice here? What's that? Join our mall walking programme, Get Fit, for free. Now, I like the sound of that. I can't afford to keep up my gym membership this term. It's too expensive. Mm, I know what you mean. But what exactly is mall walking? Sounds a bit boring to me. Hold on. OK, it may sound boring, but it might be a great opportunity to take exercise. Hmm. Think about it. A climate-controlled environment where you can take exercise without having to worry about the wind or the rain. Wind and rain? <laughs> Have you actually looked at the weather outside? It's snow and ice out there. I only came into the mall to keep warm. Well, it is winter and we are in Canada after all. Mm. So just think, by mall walking we can exercise indoors instead of outdoors. Great. And another thing, we won't have to worry about the traffic. Just think, no busy roads to cross and no rush hours to think about. Come on, it's worth a try. Mm. You're still not exactly selling it to me. Imagine walking past the same stores, and they're not even open. So what's the point of that? Oh, come on, Janos. Just think about it as an opportunity to window shop and keep an eye out for bargains. Mm. And what about all the amazing decorations and displays we can take a look at? I think it sounds like fun. <laughs> Did you say fun? <laughs> walking on a hard surface like concrete. Give me grass any day. Much more comfortable on the feet. And there's another thing. In a mall, you're always close to restrooms. And water come to that. What could be better than that? I think I know the answer to that one. Exercising in a gym is a whole lot better. Well, anyway, we can get more details at the information kiosk. So do you want to come with me or not? Uh, I'll give it a miss. I'm off to the gym to make the most of my membership before it runs out. <laughs> Now you have some time to look at questions 3 to 7. Now listen to the next part of the conversation and answer questions 3 to 7. Hello. I'd like more information about the mall walking programme. Great. We're always looking for new members. Can I just ask you how you found out about the programme? Oh, uh, on the notice board on the first floor. Oh, that's great. Most of our new members come through the website or through friends. Good to know people still read the notice board here in the mall. Yes, I guess so. Now, let me give you some details. The programme runs weekdays, Monday through Friday. And it's an early start. Wait for it. Walkers meet at 7am. 7am? That is pretty early. But come to think of it, my lectures start at 9 most mornings, so I would be able to make it back to the campus in plenty of time. Great. Actually, most members go straight on to work or college after their walk, so you're not alone. Now, our members meet here on the ground floor. Here at the information kiosk? No, just over there at the food court. Oh, the food court. OK. Yes, just follow the smell of coffee. Normally about 10 to 15 people show up for each walk, but numbers can vary. So, up to 15 in a group. That's an ideal number. Glad it's not 50. <laughs> and how long do the walks last? You can expect to walk for one hour, but some groups do less. 
half an hour or so, and a few groups even do up to an hour and a half. So it's best to check when you arrive. Which day were you thinking of starting? Now you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions eight to ten. Well, next Monday would work for me. Morning lectures have been cancelled, so I would have plenty of time. Monday, the fourth of February. Yes, that's right. Okay. So let's get your details. Can you give me your full name? Anya Karchevskaya. Can you spell your surname, please? Yes. K A R C H E V S K A Y A. And your address? Apartment twelve, two Burlington Street, and a contact telephone number: o seven five seven six three four five zero zero three. I'll just read that back: o seven five seven six three four five zero zero three. Yes. Oh, by the way, new members receive a free gift when they join, and it's a much better gift than last year. We gave people badges, but they tended to lose them. And more recently, we provided visors instead, but they weren't very popular. So this year, we're giving new members T-shirts. That's great. What colour? Yellow. I've got plenty in stock, so you can collect yours on Monday. Thanks a lot. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a man talking to teenagers about archery. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to thirteen. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk, and answer questions eleven to thirteen. Okay, can you gather round again? Is everyone here? No, we're missing two. Ah, here they come now. Right, the next activity is the last one before lunch. So, archery. And I can tell you, this activity is the favourite of a lot of our visitors. It's great fun and very relaxing. It can also be competitive. I think we should get the idea, have some practice, and then introduce a bit of competition if you're up for it. Good idea. I'm going to start with the basics. Archery is the practice, or Art, some might say, of using a bow to propel an arrow. Archery was initially used for hunting and combat, an important aspect of warfare in the distant past. Today, archery is largely a recreational activity and sport. The very first bows and arrows, and we're going back thousands of years, were very simple. The bow was straight. But bent into a curve when the string was pulled back. The further back the string was drawn, the greater the tension, and the faster and further the arrow flew. Later, bows were designed to be curved. This meant there was an existing inbuilt tension 
and the archer, that's you in a few minutes, exerted less energy drawing back the string. When curved bows were not in use, they were unstrung. That means the string was taken off, so that the bow was not left in a state of tension. I think it's interesting that almost every culture had bows and arrows at some point during their development. Of course, we've all seen Native Americans with bows and arrows in the movies, but the very oldest bows originate from Scandinavia and Northern Europe. The use of bows and arrows died out with the invention of firearms, though I must point out that the earliest gunners were far less efficient than an expert archer. Archery as a recreational activity started to become popular not long after that. Anyway, that's enough history. Do go online, though, if you want to know more. Now you have some time to look at questions 14 and 15. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 14 and 15. Right, the practical side. First of all, safety. Now, you might have played with bows and arrows when you were kids, but these bows and arrows aren't toys. They're not dangerous if used properly and safely, but they certainly can be dangerous if used carelessly. So, everyone... Please stand here on this side of the line until I say otherwise. Nobody walks towards the targets until I say it's safe to do so. When I say so, everyone puts down their bow and then we can all go into the target area. Each of you will fire one at a time. I don't want to see anyone load their bow when it's not their turn. When you've fired... You put your bow down and wait until it's your turn again. Is that clear? Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Let's take a look at the equipment. The bows are fairly heavy. You might be surprised. We'll spend a moment practicing holding the bow properly before we load one up. I'm holding it now, in the position in which you'll hold it. The drawstring is here, and, again, you might be surprised at the tension. You'll need to practice drawing back the string. Just above the middle of the bow, here, is the sight. You look through this as you would with a rifle. Using a bow and arrow without a sight is perfectly possible. Most master archers do this, but having one will certainly help you to start off with. Now I'll put the bow down and show you an arrow. The shafts of our arrows are wooden, but fibreglass arrow shafts are now common too. Traditionally, as I'm sure you'll know, the fletching at the top of the arrow, I mean, not the tip end of the arrow, was made of feathers. We have some arrows with feather fletching, but we also have some with what we call veins. That means the fletching is made of solid plastic. All of you have a quiver with six arrows in it. You should tie the strap of the quiver around your waist, like this. As I've said, you take an arrow from your quiver when I say so, when it's your turn and not before. Oh, I nearly forgot. 
protection. Everyone has a chest guard and hand guard, like those that I'm wearing. I'll show you how to put the chest guard on in a moment, and a bracer. The bracer is a smaller arm pad that protects the inside of your arm from the string. For those of you in a t-shirt today, that's important. But the bracer will also stop the string catching on the sleeve of a jumper or jacket. Right. So before we pick up the bows, let's have a look at these chest guards. Um... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. We'll hear two students talking about reading. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Hi, Malena. How's your research for your assignment going? Which assignment, Josh? The one on sustainable transport. It's due in on Friday. Oh, I've not nearly finished it. I've still got so many articles to get through. In fact. I need to read another two books on the reading list before I can even think about writing it up. It doesn't help that I'm a really slow reader. Well, why don't you practice speed reading, just like me? Oh, let me into your secret. If anything, if I don't get a move on, my assignment is going to be late. What exactly is speed reading anyway? Well, speed reading basically means reading faster and more efficiently. It can make such a difference. I've noticed the benefits already, and I've only been doing it a few weeks. Sounds good. What benefits are we talking exactly? Well, the majority of people read at an average rate of two hundred and fifty words a minute. So that means that an average page in a book or document would take you around one or two minutes to read. So up to two minutes a page. That sounds quite fast to me. I reckon I spend at least five minutes on each one. But just think about it. Imagine if you could double that rate to five hundred words a minute. You could zip through all the articles and books in half the time. Another thing is that it can help you understand the basic structure of an idea or an argument much better. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen to the next part of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. You make speed reading sound like some kind of sport. Well, actually, speed reading is a bit like playing sport. I like to think it's similar to running. Running, much too fast for me. I'm more of a jogger. You're not selling it to me very well. Okay, okay, but just think about what it takes to be a fast runner. You can learn the techniques, but to get really good at it and build up your speed, you really need to practice. But athletes train for hours every day. That's true, but your reading speed can improve if you practice a few basic techniques. 
The first thing to do is to actually find out how fast you're reading at the moment. So, time my current reading speed. But I read so slowly; it will be really depressing to find out just how slow I am. Believe me, timing yourself is a really good idea, and it's so easy to do. There are lots of online speed reading tests. You just enter the words "reading speed test" into Google, and loads will come up. You could also do a reading comprehension test and see how well you understand what you're reading. I don't know. But remember to read at your normal speed, and time yourself on a few different pages. The average of your times should indicate your average reading speed. What do I do next? Well, the next thing to do, and this is really important, is to get rid of distractions. I used to think that music in the background while I was reading was a good thing, but it wasn't for me. I found I increased my speed by working without any noise whatsoever. I usually read in the library. But there always seem to be people talking around me. Well, try using earplugs to block out all the distractions. Another important thing is to set yourself targets. Basically, if you know what your goal is, you're more likely to achieve it. My goal? Well, that's easy. I need to find out about the problems of accessible transport in Africa, and then think about some solutions. I know what I need to do, but I keep skipping back to a sentence I've just read. And at other times, I go back a few pages just to make sure that I've read something right. I know what you mean. Actually, a lot of people do that when they read. They reread material when they don't actually need to. It's called regression, and it's important to get out of the habit of doing it. You can reduce the number of times your eyes skip back by running your finger or a pencil along each line you read. Your eyes will follow the tip of your finger, and this helps you avoid skipping back. Why not give it a try? Yes. I think I'll give it a go, but I suppose the first thing to do is find out what my reading speed is. What a thought! That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a man talking about tourism and the environment. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully to the talk, and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Let's make a start. Now, over the last few weeks, we've looked at some key areas in the travel and tourism module. We've already charted the origins and development of tourism, and we've also looked at the negative effects of tourism. On both local communities and the environment. So, in this lecture, we're going to focus on ways in which tourists can actually benefit local people and natural areas if they travel responsibly. And this kind of travel is known as eco tourism. Now, there's no one definition of eco tourism. In fact. It can be interpreted in a number of different ways. This means it represents different things to different people, and sometimes people misunderstand ecotourism altogether. 
They think of it as just spending time in nature or natural areas. However, the truth is far more complex. In essence, it aims to minimize the negative impacts of tourism that we looked at earlier on in the course. Problems such as litter and water pollution, crime, and so on, and at the same time to encourage travelers to have a positive impact on the places they visit. Now, there are many other words to describe a similar idea to ecotourism. In fact, the terms alternative tourism, sustainable tourism, or responsible tourism are often used to mean the same thing. But in fact, although the main ideas behind them are similar, there are small differences. And let's briefly look at these now. Alternative tourism is any kind of tourism that is not mass tourism. And by mass tourism, we mean hundreds, if not thousands, of people going on, for example, their two weeks a year beach holidays or traditional sightseeing tours. Alternative tourism includes travel such as backpacking and adventure holidays. And the term alternative also includes ecotourism. Which is what we are mainly focusing on today. Now, what about sustainable tourism? Sustainable tourism has the same ideals as ecotourism, but it isn't limited to natural areas. So you can have a sustainable tourist experience in a city or a town, and then we have responsible tourism. What does that mean exactly? Now, basically, this involves acting responsibly and respectfully as a guest when we travel overseas. And what do we mean by respectful? Well, being respectful might involve asking permission to take photographs, or go into someone's home, observing some of the customs of the local community, such as. Dress or making an effort to learn the language. Now, eco tourism can be passive or active. So, what do we mean by passive tourism? Well, let's think of some specific examples. A passive tourist might buy their holiday package from a company that donate part of their profits to local charities, or a passive tourist. Might book environmentally friendly accommodation. This means choosing to stay in a hotel which may use solar power as a source of energy, or changes sheets and towels for their guests less frequently. Now, active eco tourism's a way for people to enjoy everything that nature has to offer, and at the same time enable them to leave a positive mark on the environment. Now, this kind of eco tourist is sometimes referred to as a voluntourist. That's a combination of volunteer and tourist. You get the idea. Now, voluntourists prefer to experience a new place in an active way, and this doesn't mean sitting in a tourist bus or listening to a pre-recorded guide. Basically. They want to physically connect with the place they're visiting, and this includes connecting with humans and animals. Now, their approach to travel can make a real difference and can really benefit the places and the communities they choose to visit. Voluntourists often help local people construct and repair buildings, or it could mean being willing to help a community with nature conservation. So let's think of some specific examples of this kind of work in action. Now, voluntourists have helped local communities to plant hundreds of trees and installed identifying signs in the rainforests of Costa Rica. They've also helped with sustainable food production in Cuba, 
and in Jamaica they've been involved in the cleaning up of local rivers, and in Thailand they've worked on building ecologically sustainable reforested habitats. Now, some of the work that voluntarists do also involves looking after endangered animals, like the giant panda project in Japan, or the animal sanctuary project in Ecuador. Now, this work doesn't just involve interacting with wildlife, but involves educating local people about the need to protect wildlife. Now, before we explore wildlife tourism in more detail, does anyone have any questions? That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. <laughs> 